being able to then return to the page, that's where the real beauty is. That's where it comes from. It's not from all of that outside stuff. Hi, Disha. Hey, Donnie. And welcome, everyone, to Ursa Short Fiction, the podcast where we geek out on our favorite short stories. I'm Donnie Walton, author of The Final Revival of Opal and Nev. And I'm Disha Filia, author of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. As always, this show is produced with support from you. Become an Ursa member today by going to ursastory.com slash join. You'll get exclusive bonus episodes and you'll help fund future stories and conversations. Today, we are excited to welcome Jamil John Kochai on the show. He is the author of The Haunting of Haji Hotak and Other Stories, a finalist for the 2022 National Book Award, and 99 Nights in Logar, a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award for Debut Novel and the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. His short stories and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Plowshares, The O. Henry Prize Stories 2018, and The Best American Short Stories. Kochai was a Stegner Fellow at Stanford University and a Truman Capote Fellow at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Currently, he is a Hodder Fellow at Princeton University. If you haven't listened to Jamil's story enough on our last episode, go do that and then come back here for our conversation. So Jamil is an extraordinary writer, and he was a year behind me, Disha, at Iowa. Mm-hmm. And okay. I remember when he came in, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing all this, but <laughs> we like I hosted a little get together because I tried to kind of like um, look out for the new students of color who were coming in. And so mm-hmm. when the new ones came in the year after, I would hold little lunches, little things. And, and Jamil came in and he was so amazing and unassuming and humble and just like very observant and everything. And unfortunately, my whole time in Iowa, I did not have a chance to be in a workshop with Jamil, but I started hearing from my classmates, Mm -hmm. he's so brilliant. Oh my gosh, his stories were amazing. But by then I was in my second year and I didn't get a chance to like, we would, you know, the workshop students would have their stories on a shelf. So if you were curious, you could pull a story or whatever. And so I didn't get a chance to do that. And then he started winning all these awards. (laughs) I was like, oh my gosh. And then you know, we decided we wanted to read this, this collection for the podcast. And I was blown away by the characters in these stories who are so alive and so real for me. And how Jamil is able to embody all these various different characters. I mean, we have gamers, Mm -hmm. we have government spies, we have grieving elderly mothers, we have doctors, activists, people who transform into animals. And Jamil is just jumping between these perspectives Mm -hmm. in a way that is completely believable Mm -hmm. and yet also magical at the same time. And I feel like we are dropped into these stories from the very first line. So it's almost like being in a video game reading these stories because you're just immediately yeah. you hit the ground running. And uh, and we you know, we talked to Jamil about this, but that word about that word propulsive like this is, you yes. know, when people talk about a story being propulsive, you know, that's story after story after story in this collection that, you know, as a reader, um, it you know from the very first line as i said he just draws you right into the moment um and and i appreciated this book this collection you know on many levels but from a craft perspective i was just like how does he do that as someone who gets mired in backstory when especially when i'm drafting yes. you know oh i'm like how do you know that this is the perfect moment to start this story i am all in with you, with this character, yes. with these circumstances. Um, and so, you know, he is, as you said, such a brilliant, gifted writer. That gift of the immersion in these stories from the outset is fantastic. It definitely speaks to a certain confidence, and I'm not sure that I've achieved myself. In I am that sure that I have like, not. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? And I, you know, it's just amazing. He just sort of lays it plain. He's like, here's what's happening in this mm-hmm. story. And it just grabs you by the collar. And it's like, you're, as you said, you're completely in. We had such a wonderful conversation with Jamil. So without further ado, here it is, Jamil John Kochai. Jamil. 
Jamil John Kochai, we are beyond thrilled to have you with us on Ursa. Welcome. Hey, it's a, it's a total honor to be here. So excited about it. Well, you, you know, I just was so blown away by your book, by The Haunting of Haji Hotak. And we're so excited to get into the nitty gritty of the stories and about your process. But I think one of the things that I love the most about this collection is that it's so steeped in the history of Afghanistan, of the United States. Yeah. Haunting, I think, is the operative word in your title, yeah. um, because so many of the characters throughout the book are grappling with lingering grief and trauma tied to the Soviet occupation and war. Even the protagonist of the first story, playing Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, he's too young to have lived it. But he experiences sort of this intergenerational grief um, that trickles right. down to him in a very unique, uh, nearly magical way. And I really related to this book because I, I feel like in my own work, I'm incorporating the effects of real events that happened in the years like long before I was born. Mm. And I remember being very surprised in an ironic way that that my work was considered historical fiction because to me, like my own relationship to my country's history is is inextricable from everything I'm thinking about all the time. It's just like the fiction that I write. So I'm curious how you feel about how history operates uh, in your work um, as inspiration or as background, and also about how your loved ones who were alive during those times have responded to, to these beautiful stories. Well, you know, it's funny, Donnie, because I think I do, I feel sort of a, a similar way to you, it just in that, like, I found it sort of odd at times to hear my story, his stories described as, as, as political in nature or historical yeah. in nature or, or grappling with these different um, sort of like large conceptual themes when, um, when for me, it just, it felt, it felt very natural and, and organic to write in this manner, just because, you know, my first introduction to uh, the, the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and to the politics of the cold war and, and to, you know, to all these revolutions and, and civil wars that occurred in Afghanistan, it wasn't in, in history books, but it was, it was just in these, these oral stories that my, my family would tell me from, um, from a very young age. And so, you know, it just I grew up with those stories. It was it was um, it was a very intrinsic part of how how I lived my childhood and how like I understood both my own identity and background, but also like storytelling as a form as well. And so, you know, years later when I'm starting to, you know, put these stories down on the page for the first time and I'm doing these workshops and I'm I'm starting to consider myself a, a creative writer, it just it felt very, very natural to to go back to this history and it, and to incorporate it into the stories. Yeah. And just a follow up question to to go back a little bit. When when did you first start writing stories and how did you know that this was the path for you? You know, I would say it was probably I think it was my senior year of high school. Um, it's it's funny because my English teacher at the time during my junior year, she almost sort of forced me into the class. She's, she's sort of well known for being like sort of the tough teacher. And and I'd gotten like a, a 70 percent the first semester in her class, barely passed. I had to like beg her to give me this the C minus. And um, but then the second semester, I did really well. And I got like one of my my only A's during high school. And so she was like, you know, I'm doing this creative writing class. I need more students in it so that it doesn't like get canceled. You have to be in the wow. class. And I was like, so I was like, I was totally intimidated by her. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. And so so I ended up taking this class during my senior year of high school when when like I wanted to use that period to just you know goof off or or whatever. And um and I ended up loving it. The other students were really supportive. My creative writing teacher was really supportive. And so I it was sort of this like it was. A, instantaneous love affair with with storytelling and with the short story as a form in particular and so when i ended up going to um when i ended up going to Sac sacramento state the next year one of the first things i did was i i tried to look up you know who if there are any creative writing classes and then um and from that point on i ended up taking like a fiction writing course pretty much every single semester of like my entire academic career and um so so that's that's where it really started as a senior year of high school. <laughs> wow. And you've you've written before about uh, another teacher that that greatly influenced you. That was an elementary school teacher, am I right? I remember that thread that went viral that you wrote. 
Yeah, that was my uh, second grade teacher, uh, Mrs. Lung. She um, she was the one. She was really the teacher who like actually taught me how to read and write. Because like when I'd entered kindergarten, I, I grew up in a household that all exclusively spoke Pashto and Farsi. And for some reason, like I don't even know how this happened. Like I just had no encounter with the English language. And so like I'm entering kindergarten, I, I don't speak a word of English, and um, and it was really difficult. I don't think the kindergarten teacher knew how to sort of do with with teaching English as a second language. And so uh, I didn't end up learning how to read and write until I met Mrs. Lung in the second grade. I was like way behind all the other students. And then she she would sit with me every single day after school. And I went from like not knowing my alphabets to like by the end of the year, I was like winning awards for reading comprehension. And so, wow. so yeah, I, I owe her a lot. And I lost contact with her for years and years. And it was this whole sort of like, like arduous journey to, to find her again. We ended up meeting for the first time just a couple of months ago. And so that was really sweet. It was a great way to kick off the the book, uh, the book journey for, for the haunting of Haji Otak. Ah, oh, beautiful. So Jamil, I listened to so much of this collection on audio. I was listening and reading along and kind of going back and forth. And I have to say the audio is stellar. I was particularly wowed by the propulsion and the building emotion of Enough and that narrative voice in that story, which is about, you know, an elderly woman who's increasingly frustrated by the state of her life in America and going on rants about her daughter-in-law and all of these things in, in a very funny way, but also a very moving way. That voice is so compelling and it's both like breathless and rhythmic in, in the rage that builds throughout it. So I'm curious how you develop that voice. And did you also find yourself kind of reading it while you were writing it to get the sound right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that's one of those, uh, that story is like one of those rare experiences where um, where the voice and the perspective and the characters and the central conflict, like it, it all came together rather quickly. And it was, and it was funny because like there, there's a certain, I think there's a certain momentum to, to reading the story, but I also like, I felt that momentum while writing it as well. And so, you know, I almost immediately, you know, as soon as I wrote those first couple of lines, I had the sense that this story was going to have like this this sort of uh, very propulsive energy to it, that it was going to be sort of written in the form of like this long rant. And from that point on, it sort of just it became sort of a challenge for me to see how long mm. I could keep that momentum and that verve and that um, and that like the music of the voice itself, how long I could keep it going. And so my intention initially wasn't for it to be like this this 10 page sentence uh, or however long it ended up being but um but it just kept going and i found that i had the the, the voice didn't want to stop until until it sort of uh, until it reached the end of the story. And that was actually sort of my signal to sort of wrap things up as well. And so, yeah, the, that, that that story was just sort of one of those um, one of those rare magical experiences where it almost feels like the um, the, the voice is writing the story itself. Yeah. And I love that you you highlighted the challenge of different forms. Like, and yeah. I thought about that as well in Occupational Hazards, which is sort of written in the form of like a very long style resume that's telling um, the, the protagonist's whole life story. And there's there's a challenge in it, but there's also a bit of a freedom in it somehow yeah, for me, um, where if you have parameters and you can kind of go wild within within those lines. Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, I remember very early on my first um, creative writing professor, Doug Rice, one of the things that he said to me, uh, that state of my uh, mind forever was that in storytelling, sometimes you have to build walls in order to dance within them. And um, and I really needed to hear that at that time because like everything I was writing, like it felt like, like it just sort of wanted to explode off of the page. I couldn't figure out like whether to contain the story within a couple of days or like 
hundreds of years. So I was like, I was like psyching myself out. But as soon as I heard that from my professor, and it's a quote that I that I come back to often now, like I'm, I'm always sort of looking for different sort of um, not necessarily restrictions, but it's that idea of like building a wall or like having a particular form to challenge yourself into seeing how you can fit a story sort of inside of a box or whether in fact you you do actually need to sort of explode that box in different ways. I right? mm-hmm. So I want to build on this, use the language of exploding and propulsion. And, and I chuckled when I looked at our list of questions and, and Donnie, I saw that we both asked about the propulsive quality of all of these stories, you know, um, enough in, in particular, but I just, I remember the first time I read someone's book described as propulsive and then, you know, how you see something and then you see it everywhere. Um, yeah. but I don't think I've ever <laughs> felt something as propul mm-hmm. a story as propulsive until this collection, like the, you know, every story starts with something, you know, there's a very vivid, um, scene, opening scene, these very voicey narrators that just pull us into, you know, their very tumultuous worlds. And the stories are just full of energy and movement emotionally and physically as well. And so Donnie was asking about establishing the voice. And I'm curious, you know, are you the kind of writer that can just, you know, sort of nail that opening scene, that propulsive opening scene, um, and then go from there? Or is that something where it's part of your revision process? Most of the time, it it takes quite a while for me to to figure out that narrative voice. With playing Metal Gear Solid and Enough in particular, like I figured out the voice and the momentum like fairly quickly, but that's like a really rare magical experience for me. For most of my stories, it's like really this arduous long process of trying to figure out things like proper narrative distance and what perspective I'm writing it from and what character is it gonna be focusing on and what scene to start off with. But you're exactly right that like once I sort of figure out that voice um, and Sometimes that happens quickly. Sometimes it takes forever. But once I figure out that that the voice, that first paragraph, that first scene, um, that's when that's when the story really starts to get going for me. And so, you know, I'm not sure if it's because like I'm a particularly impatient writer, but I find that like I really need that that momentous feeling, that sense of propulsion, in order to get my stories going and to um, and then to figure out where where the characters want to go, what the plot wants to do and all of those different elements that that go into story writing. It's very apparent, you know, that you just have that thoughtfulness about it. And, and you know, it, it's one of those stories that like as a writer, you know, you first you read it to read it for pleasure as a reader and then coming back and looking at it as a writer, you know, how did you do that? And so I just appreciated seeing, you know, the care that you took because these uh-huh. are very carefully crafted stories, which, you know, just made them even more delightful to read. You Thank also... You throughout the collection return to a core family in these stories. A patriarch with chronic pain, uh, his body destroyed by years of hard physical labor, his late brother, um, Watak, did I pronounce that That's correctly? That's right. Who's killing by the Soviets um, during the occupation has ripple effects on the whole family. And then there's stewing, grieving mother. So which of these characters started the family story for you? And then how did that character lead to the others? Well, it's, you know, it's funny you ask that because I, I mean, uh, to be honest, like many of those characters are, it's, um, it's, it's highly autobiographical. So, you know, my, uh, my, my father's the, you know, he, he was a laborer and, um, and he did deals with sort of constant physical pain. My my father had um, had a brother who who died during the Soviet War, and um, and his um, and and his brother, you know, he, uh, his name was Watak, and um, he was only 16 years old. He died in in 1982. But but the odd thing was is that his his presence um, like existed. You know, he sort of he sort of haunted our home in this really really formative way. And uh, so, you know, I remember all throughout my life and my childhood, like 
I, I, I felt like I knew what took but even better than, than some of my living relatives back in Afghanistan, just because of how often the story of his life was told. And then, and then of course, like how often it felt like everything in my, in my family, like the, the family history and the family trauma, it all circulated around the death of what took. And so, as you mentioned, it's a theme and it's a topic, it's a subject that I, that I constantly return to um, in my stories and in, and in my novel and in, in the current novel that I'm writing right now. It's just, I think it's it's so fundamentally a part of how I understood storytelling growing up that that it's a theme that I that I constantly return to. And so, you know, the those characters that you mentioned, the 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 sort of the, the beleaguered father, the the martyred a brother, the, the the grieving mother; those are all sort of characters that are that are rooted in my own family, and so I think that's why I <laughs> that's why my stories are so often focused on on sort of grieving dysfunctional families because um, because I lived in one, <laughs> and that's where a mm-hmm. lot of my stories come from. <laughs> mm-hmm. So many of us did, you know, and Mm -hmm. I I was in a conversation today um, with a university class, a writing class, and we were talking about drawing on your own life um, in writing fiction. Um, Uh But the importance of not just making it fiction because you want to disguise things, but because it's the kernel of of something really true and really important, uh, like grief. Um, But then using our storytelling powers to build these you know, worlds that in many ways are more interesting than our everyday lives, you know, so like f- family, yeah. our families are, a, it's, a, it's a, a launching pad, it's a jumping off point. It's not yeah. necessarily the destination for the story. Yeah, that's so beautifully stated. And, you know, we keep talking about this story, but I, I want to ask one more question about playing Metal Gear Solid um, Five, The Phantom Pain. When I first read that one, it brought to mind a story titled King of the Hill by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. I don't know if either of you have read that story. Um, Not but that it, story, I don't but think I have. Yeah. But I'm you know Nana's work. work. Yeah. yeah. So he's, this one is very tough. It's not in his collection. It's not in Friday Black. It was published, I believe, after Friday Black. One of the first lines is like, I was playing such and such a game. Or the first time I was called a nigger, I was playing whatever game. And so, you know, it's a story that features a main character who's a gamer. And Nana uses the video game premise to delve into some obviously deeper issues around race. Um, And so I immediately thought of that story when I was reading um, Playing Metal gear solid five and that led me to wonder who are some of the writers who inspire and inform your work oh to start off i would say gabriel garcia marquez is uh that's sort of the 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 looming figure in my life uh ever since i read 100 years of solitude for the first time i think um everything that i've written uh, up to this point has been written sort of sort of in the shadow of that novel and and trying to sort of accomplish that or, or get at that feeling that i first had when i first finished that novel and was just completely in awe of everything that it had accomplished but um so so Marquez is is a huge figure. I would say uh, James Baldwin is another figure that looms very large in my life. I teach Sonny's Blues, I, I think, almost every single class that I, that I teach. And so mm. um, that's a story that, like, every single time I get to that the final scene in that story, I still cry every time. And so that's one of those, I think, as a, um, as a pinnacle of of short story writing, like, I think that's that's a point that, that I often try to reach as well. And then, you know, uh, Sandra Cisneros was was very important to me. The the first time that I read D- Daniel uh, Moenadin's collection in other rooms, uh, other wonders, that was that was very formative in terms of just how I understood like what a short story collection could accomplish as a whole. Uh, just because like these interconnected stories and every story sort of telling um, a story from uh, a different perspective and of this one of this like incredibly wealthy landowner's house. So you get you get a story from the perspective of the landowner. You get a story from perspective of um, of a cook. You get a story from the perspective of a driver. And, and so there was something about that collection in particular that really sort of reshaped how how I was thinking about um, short story collections as a whole. Uh, but but yeah, those are just some of the some of the few. Thanks. A great reading list. Yeah. <laughs> So Jamil, correct me if I'm wrong, but you are only 30 years old. 
That's right. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. I bring that up because you have accomplished what most short story writers can only dream about. (laughs) Short story writers who are twice your age. In addition to being a National Book Award finalist for this collection, you have been a Stegner Fellow, Hotter Fellow, Truman Capote Fellow, and you've had not one, not two, but three fiction publications in The New Yorker. And we joke a lot about being very young baby writers and like doing our first submissions and like submitting to The New uh-huh. Yorker because we don't know <laughs> any better and like right? just like aiming uh-huh. too high. <laughs> Jamil, you've done it three times. So I have to ask you, for those of us who want to live vicariously, Take us through getting that news and that of that first acceptance and what it's like to see your work published in that most coveted of literary venues. Yeah, it is funny because the first time that my agent and I we submitted a story to to the New Yorker, I felt like we were we were shooting too high. And and in fact, I was sort of right in that feeling just because they the first story that I submitted, and this is like right after we we sold the book. And so like I felt like I had this momentum in my career and stuff. Um, but even then, like I submitted the first story, they held it for 10 months and then uh, and then promptly rejected it. And, ten um, and months? So like, I'm sorry, <laughs> 10 months. Yeah, yeah, what? it was yeah, and it was <laughs> and it was excruciating because like um I was like particularly proud of this story and I was like uh you know if so if they reject it then we send it somewhere else but then they held it for 10 months and then and you know my agent was telling me that like you know when you submit it to the New Yorker they don't like it when you submit to other places and I was like mm-hmm. oh my god and so they held it for 10 months promptly rejected it and then uh and I was like oh okay uh so so we just keep working and then but it was funny you know I wrote shortly after that I wrote playing Metal Gear Solid 5 and and that was a story it was again like it was one of those sort of just it was like this sort of magical sort of unreal experience where um where it just sort of you know so it was one of those uh, writing experiences where it just sort of flows off the fingertips i finished it i uh, and and i ended up showing it to my agent and my agent the, like one of the first things she wrote back to me is like we're sending this to the new yorker this is going to get into the new yorker and she, she was so confident about it and i was like there's no way like they they t- held the first one for 10 months ended up rejecting it that totally sucked and so i was like you know let's let's aim a little lower but she was like she was adamant about we're going to send it to the new yorker first and then i think that one day they only held for um it was 2 months and then it got accepted and i got the news that it was going to to be accepted in the New Yorker. And it was such a funny feeling at the time because I don't know, there was, you know, the, I think there's so much, um, there's so much anxiety and there's so much self doubt and, uh, and, and frankly, like, like different forms, like self hatred almost in, 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 in the writing life. And I remember even after uh, selling and publishing my debut novel for the first time, I still had that like lingering, like imposter syndrome. Like I didn't feel like a writer, but, but getting that story into the New New Yorker and getting that response back that was like one of those moments where I was like oh my god like uh, like I, I felt like a writer sort of <laughs> for the first time and it was a spectacular like uh sort of cl- floating on cloud nine sort of feeling and incredibly intimidating to be in contact with uh with Deborah Treisman for the first time <laughs> um but but I have to say like I had a really, really lovely experience, like editing, like I've had really bad editing experiences, but, but, but the, all three of the stories and, and especially the first one, like it was, it was so smooth and, and she was so smart. And then on top of that, like it, she was always very careful as well about making sure like that, that my particular vision and that my particular voice in that story, like she didn't want to mess with that all through her revisions. And I've had, situations in the past where editors have come on come into my stories and just chop them to pieces and mm. in ways that were disconcerting but but that wasn't the experience at all with with Deborah and so yeah you know it was sort of everything that I could have imagined <laughs> wow and I, I have a quick follow-up um, to that which is with all the success you've had and all the fanfare and acclaim how do you get into a place of quieting your mind and going back to the page and starting something new? 
You know, it's it's funny. It did take some time, I think. I had to really develop and, and grow into a place where I was able to compartmentalize like the 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 writing as this like public thing, as this financial or this thing in the marketplace, and and the writing as just as an act of writing, right? And um, and in the beginning that was really difficult for me. And I remember, you know, when when I first got the book published and I first started like when I first started seeing my name in, in reviews and uh, and I, you know, I made a Twitter for the first time just to promote the book. And there was something about that sense of becoming like a like a I don't want to say a public figure necessarily because I, I still don't think like like I'm a huge dealer or anything. But it, nonetheless, like there was something about that that was oddly like like it wasn't good for my identity. Like it felt like a like a little bit like I was being like fractured a little bit like there was there was Jamil, the writer, and then and then Jamil the person and I couldn't I couldn't come to terms with that and so it, it took me some time uh, I remember to sort of develop into this feeling that like I could separate the writing from all of the noise is is what I call it yeah. and just writing as writing and it's something that I really emphasize to my students as well because I think there, there's so much emphasis placed upon getting published and and getting the you know the the biggest book contract and and getting all of the awards and and getting all you know the reviewed in the New York Times and all those things and I try to emphasize to my students that like even if all of those things happen like it's never enough and it's never like no matter what happens there that there's always this this like hole inside of yourself that like you you need to do the next thing and you're you're still riddled by self doubt you're still riddled by anxiety even to this day, like I'm still like I don't even know like how I can consider myself a, a writer with a with like a capital W. But despite all of that, like being able to then return to the page, like that's where that's where the real beauty is. That's where the real like love of the craft is. That's where that's where like the actual feeling of like growth and and f fulfillment. That's that's where it comes from. It's not from all of that outside stuff. And and I know like that can seem like. I don't know. You know, I, I remember when when I when I hadn't published a thing and sort of just a, a no name writer with nothing, not a single publication to my name. And and if I heard that from someone, I would have been totally annoyed. But it's true. Like it, it has to. I, I really feel like it has to be about the writing itself because all that other stuff. It's it's. Um. I don't know how to describe it. It's really like disconcerting and and disturbing, and mm -hmm. it can really break you down. I think in really odd ways you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. But then being able to return to the writing just as writing, that's where that's where the real beauty is. And I'm so excited to hear that you're working on something new involving Watak. That's right. Yeah. It's uh yeah. yeah, it's the it's a new it's a new novel project, which is uh which is scary because I haven't, you know, I haven't delved back into a novel project since ninety nine nights in Logad, which is which was sort of this this arduous, uh anxiety ridden process. And I really loved writing the stories. And so so we'll see what happens. It's always a new journey. Well, getting back to the stories for a second, um, you know, three of them, the three that were published in the New Yorker are part of this collection. But I have to say, probably my favorite story in the collection is Bakhtawara and Miriam. That's there true. are so many powerful and complex women characters in these stories. And you write beautifully deep into their interior lives in a way that I, I don't know that many men could or would even dare to attempt to write. So I was especially interested in the women friends who are the heart of Bakhtawara and Miriam. Uh, one of them takes on the burden of saving her family from shame, and the other, um, who is her good friend through the, the wall, um, has been disfigured by her husband in, in an acid attack. Can you talk about what you considered when approaching these women characters and the friendship between them? You know, I mean, it's it's funny because I do think like while writing that story, I was always very conscious of the fact that I'm a man writing these these female characters, right? And that's something that like whether whether I'm writing about characters uh, about Afghan characters 
in Afghanistan or or in particular, you know, with that story I'm writing about, you, you know, uh, Afghan women in Afghanistan, like I try to approach that story with a certain level of, of consciousness of the fact that doubting myself in that instance, it's not necessarily like a bad thing. It's one of the things that I talk to my students about as well when they approach me and they tell me that, you know, they, they feel oddly about writing Afghan characters or they feel oddly about writing characters outside of their experience, right? And and I've heard writers in the past sort of say, sort of dismiss those concerns and be like, you know, fiction writing, it's it's all about creativity, it's all about empathy, like just write whoever you want and and do it. And I don't take that approach. Like I think that if you have lingering feelings of doubt about writing outside of your experience, that that's actually not a bad thing. That shouldn't be dismissed. And that it, in fact, like, you you should engage that and you should think through that. And so that's one of the things that like that I try to um, that that when I have those feelings of doubt or, or, or concerns or or just consciousness about uh, differences in experience or differences in privilege or differences in power, that I don't dismiss that. And, and as much as possible, that I then try to struggle with that on the page itself. And that's what I tell my students is that when you have those doubts, put it on the page, try to see how how it comes about in, in the story itself. And so with Bakhtawara and Maryam, you know, I knew that I wanted to write this story about this friendship between these two women. And and throughout writing that story, I I, I tried to remain as, as conscious as I could of these differences in, in experience and how much I could actually, you know, how much I could actually understand about that. And, and you know, so it's one of those things where where the different tools of, of fiction writing can be very helpful. And so, you know, it's one of those reasons why I, that I wrote that story from the third person. I feel like it would be very difficult, for example, to have written that story in the first person from the perspective of Bakhtawara, but the third person allows me a certain allows me a certain level of distance where you know even when I'm like writing sort of these introspective passages or whether I'm de- delving into you know sort of the more internal feelings of Bakhtawara or Miriam or or any of the other characters in that story there's this level of distance that that sort of sets me at ease and 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 I feel like more so that I'm that I'm watching and that I'm trying to understand these characters but but at the same time it's one of those instances where I feel like doubt can actually be be very helpful in the writing of the story because I I've had experiences where where I've read stories and the overconfidence I think or even sometimes mm-hmm. it like borders on like <laughs> audaciousness Arrogance. of the writing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It comes yeah. through on the page and it's and it's very like it, it, it affects the writing itself. And I try to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah. And I, I just appreciate the, you know, that you grapple with the complexity of this issue, because so often the question is reduced to, you know, who's allowed and can I, you know, and, and yes, that's the least, exactly. that's the least interesting, you know, aspect uh-huh. of the question, you know, it obviously we can, we can write about anything we want to write, but it's then what, you know, then what happens after right. that? Exactly. And, and so I just appreciate that you, you know, have given us as writers a way, a lens through which to, to think through and give that question the, you know, the attention that it deserves, because it's not a simple matter of, you know, can I, you know, am I allowed and and that sort of thing, which I think is really reductive. And, you know, one of my favorite responses to the question about, you know, when it's called appropriation, right? You know, just sort of bringing it down to that is uh, there was a speech that Colson Whitehead gave and, um, and he likened it to himself being a black man making Korean fried chicken. And he Mm. was saying that, you know, when, when he makes it, even though he's not Korean and it tastes good, no one cares that, as a black man, he made <laughs> Korean fried chicken. It's when it when yeah. you fuck it up that <laughs> it's a problem, yeah. you know. Right. That's and great. so That's for great. us as writers, you know, the ways that we mess it up is is when we do harm and when we don't mm-hmm. think consider the historical context in which we mm-hmm. are telling someone else's story or the social um, or economic context in which we're telling us, you know, someone else's story or or telling a story that is you know, beyond our personal experience. Um, And so, you know, I just appreciate, you know, your call for us to 
be thoughtful and to to listen to those voices inside us and the voices outside that say tread lightly not that you yes. can't or that you yes. shouldn't but give it the care <laughs> and concern yep. that it deserves yeah and it's definitely yeah. those voices that keep you on your toes and make you do the work mm-hmm. for sure absolutely yeah. And, and, you know, I think, and part of it, I think also comes from just growing up. Like I remember everything that I read about Afghanistan, every, every novel, and even like other forms of cultural media films, it it was all by white people. And it was always done so poorly. It was always done with such a lack of care. It was always very reductive and they, they, they relied upon stereotypes and there's so much you know, demonization and dehumanization that I think, you know, when I, when I entered my own, you know, career as, uh, as a writer and as this, as an artist, like I just, I always wanted to make sure that I didn't do that in my stories and that I was always very careful. I think, and I think you're exactly right. Like just, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with treading lightly and with just adding a certain level of, of attention and extra care to our stories. I think that can only improve Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. For sure. So let's go a little deeper into your process as a writer. Can you talk about how you ordered the stories? Um, Because there's definitely an arc that we try and build into our collections. What was that process like for you? Well, you know, it's it's funny because it was it was sort of like ordering the stories in the collection. It was sort of this very mysterious process to me, like going into it. I remember like sometimes when, when reading a collection, the logic and the order, it feels so right and it feels so proper mm-hmm. and, and one story is flowing very beautifully into the next story. But sometimes and it's funny because like I've read really great collections where it, it can feel like a little bit like kind of random at times and mm-hmm. and you're not always sure why one story comes after the next one and so when I was entering this story a lot of it, it the ordering the stories it was very much it, it, it was a project that I sort of shared with both my agent and my editor and we discussed the order of the stories and we were trying to see like what what was the best way to sort of uh, maintain the momentum of the story to flow from one story into the next one. And it, it was odd because it sort of, it oddly like matched my own writing process where I don't oftentimes when I'm writing, I don't, I don't often think of like the big picture of the story. I just, I'm moving from one sentence to the next one, one voice to the next. And with the story collection, it, it was kind of the same thing. Like it was just this story makes sense as of the opening. What story would, you know, either thematically or uh, in terms of its form or in terms of its voice, like what story would flow from that one well, which one would give the reader a nice little surprise in the next story. And then, and then of course, you know, what I've been sort of tied is that you always sort of want to then end the collection with, with a bang, with one, the, with the story that you think is, is either like the strongest in the collection or, or the second strongest. And so that's what we sort of did. It, it was almost like putting a puzzle together. Love that. And you are the rare guest who has had both a novel and a collection published. And so I'm curious how each of those books challenged you or helped you grow as a writer. So the novel I remember, and I'm not sure if it was just because it was the first time I was ever putting a book together and I was dealing with grad school and I was dealing with the publishing industry for the first time. But I remember the novel being such like an arduous process. And, and I think, you know, in fact, that it's something about novel writing itself that like it just lends to like obsessiveness. Like I remember I would go to sleep thinking about the novel. I would wake up thinking about the novel. I would be eating and thinking about the novel. I would be driving to <laughs> class. And it was just, it, you know, it was it was all consuming. Whereas with the short story collection, there was something about like being able to move from one story to the next that felt so incredibly liberating. You know, it wasn't this feeling of being overwhelmed by the project. I didn't feel like as obsessive about it. And in fact, like being able to, you know, stop one story and and move on to another one. I, I felt like I had more of a freedom to experiment with the narratives, to to do different things in with form and with uh, with with the sentences and with the structure of the stories. Whereas 
with novel writing, it just feels like every decision that I made with the novel was so high stakes because it was just like, you know, I, I was committing years of my life to that project. There was so many pages that I was wrangling with. Whereas the story, because it's like it's these individual little worlds, 10, 10 or 20 pages at a time, maybe sometimes a little longer, I ended up realizing that I loved like I love writing short stories, I think, much more than the novels, which is which is surprising to me because I I'd sort of entered creative writing thinking that that I was more of a novelist. But then after writing the novel and the story collection, I sort of I don't know, I feel like I'm leaning more toward being like a like a short story writer. <laughs> Happy news for us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a short story by another writer that you wish you had written? Yes, absolutely. There's a story called Train to Harbin by Asako uh, Shirazawa in her collection called Inheritors. And and that's a story where um, I remember reading that story for the first time. And toward the end of the story, everything is is building up to this revelation and, and this medical operation that's going to occur. And I remember reading that scene and just like my jaw was literally on the floor as I'm mm-hmm. reading this scene. And it had like this immediate impact on my body. It was it was goosebump inducing. It was it was absolutely momentous in the way that it was like looking wide eyed at the consequences of violence and war in a way that I, I think happens, at least for me, like very rarely. And so that was a story where it just the, the writing of that scene in particular felt so incredibly brave to me that I thought like, you know, one of these days, if I can write a scene as as compelling and powerful as that one, I will have accomplished something really significant. Thank you. Beautiful. I have to check that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, please do. So many of these stories also include very delightful, magical elements. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it made me wonder, what, if any, are the writing rituals that you have that help you get into sort of that magic of writing those stories? So this took me like quite a long time to figure out as well. It's funny because I remember like just early on, like my approach to creative writing was so funny because I would just, I would go to like a cafe or I would go to my office or I'd go to my room and I would set down the laptop, I would open the Word doc and I'd just be like, now write and 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 I'll like try to force it <laughs> upon myself. You know, it's, it's, it, it, I was like treating it like I don't know, like uh, like I was fixing a, a table or or something like that. Like it was just something that had to be done. And it's and it's funny. Like it took me a long time to realize that creativity. It's like this sort of, as you mentioned, it's sort of this oddly spiritual sort of magical endeavor. And you kind of like, I figured out that you kind of have to put yourself into the mood to like, to like sort of unlock that part of my brain. And so, so some of the things that I do now is that like, I'll return to the same location. I try to make sure that um, I have sunlight. I try to make sure that, that there's something that, that I'm near a window and that there's something I can look at outside, like in between, you know, when I'm just looking up from the page, I, I try to have trees near me as much as possible. If, if possible, cafes are helpful for me just because um, both the, the process of people watching can be helpful. And also like the, the, the act of actually journeying to another place to write, there's something about that that kicks my brain into high gear as well. I try to make sure that that I read before I write now. It is something that like I wouldn't do in the past because I was so eager. I felt like I had never had any time to write. And I'll just be like, okay, time to write now. And now like I make sure that I'll read a chapter of a book that that I, you know, that I'll find that, that its prose is beautiful because I find that inspirational. And then to go along with that, I try as much as possible to have my Self surrounded by books at the same time so that if I come to a place in the writing where where I hit a wall or I can't figure out a character or I don't know what to do next with the scene, I, I'll have sort of all these inspirational, formative books nearby to be able to be like, okay, now I can grab that and see you know, what did what did Toni Morrison do to get out of that jam? Or what did Marquez do, this character? And, um, and I find that very helpful as well. And I'm curious, um, your collection is full of, you know, just some amazing sentences. Jamil, what would you say is the best sentence you've ever written? 
That's that's a tough question. I would say probably the the last sentence from playing Metal Gear Solid Five. That's a sentence that's that's pretty dear to me, and it's a sentence that came together. I I get annoyed by how often I say that, but it it came together sort of magically. Like I was like seeing the sentence. And I was seeing the scene that the sentence is is referring to as I was writing it. And that feeling is it's so like it's so mystical and so beautiful to me that anytime I read that sentence, it reminds me of that feeling. And so, so that's one of my I think that's one of my favorites. Can you read it for us? I sure can. Yeah, I, <laughs> I've got it open here with your father on one shoulder and your uncle on the other. And with the lights of the Soviet gunfire dying away at the outer edges of your vision, you trudge deeper into the darkness of the cave. And though you cannot be sure that your father and his brother are still alive, that they haven't been shot in the chaos, that they are not now corpses, you feel compelled to keep moving into a darkness so complete that your reflection becomes visible on the screen of the television in front of you. And it is as if the figures in the image were journeying inside of you delving into your flesh to be saved. And I just want to note for those of you who still need to pick up this book, if you need any more convincing, right? Because that was just gorgeous. (laughs) I love the way that this story is formatted physically on the page. And that last bit that to be saved is in that video game font. I don't know what you call it. um, Pixelated almost or pixelated. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And that just like adds to to the beauty and the magic of the story. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Did you have that particular request to to have that in there or how did that work? No, that was that was actually the, the book designer or or my editor. Um, you know, I should actually I figure out who was behind that because I, I, I agree it was brilliant. And it, it wasn't me. Like I have it sort of separated and that was sort of the intention it was like referring to like save points and video games but then but then they went ahead and they like designed it in that way and i thought it was so beautiful oh so clever thank you to that person um (laughs) so we just have a couple of fill in the blank questions for you sure the hardest part of writing a short story is the hardest part of writing a short story is putting the world of the story together Mm-hmm. And my favorite part of writing a short story is oddly enough, it's it's revision. I, they, they, you know, there's uh, something about the the length and uh, you know the 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 sort of the, the precision of a short story that like when I get into the revising mode, it's like such a um, it's such a, like a delicious challenge to me. <laughs> love it, love it, a delicious challenge. That's how we should think about revision, absolutely. And not like horror <laughs> nightmare the way so many. <laughs> right. Well, and right. That's, it's funny because novel revision to me is a nightmare, but that I think it's uh, comparatively like short stories is such, uh, it's much a sweeter, it's a much sweeter experience. This has been such a great conversation and I'm I'm inspired um, as somebody who is working on both another collection and a novel for the first time. Um, you've given me oh, love. so much encouragement in this conversation. So thank you. Oh, th- yes. thank you. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Jamil, for being here today. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. If you like what we're doing at URSA, be sure to share this podcast with your friends. And if you'd like to support us directly, become an URSA member by going to ursastory.com slash join. You'll help fund production of this show and keep us going. We'll see you next time.